Uh, so first of all, welcome to the, I guess, uh, third annual meeting of the Social Media Health Network membership uh, here. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, the purpose is to uh, stimulate discussion, uh, to uh, get us much more in the interactive and discussion format versus the presentation. We want to help in delivery of care. I think there's many, you know, many of us have stories that share how we're using social media as part of our care delivery. We know that in crisis management, it's very important. The health system I'm, I'm at uh, went during Hurricane Sandy last year used social media as a very effective way to reach out to our community and our employees about what to do. We know social media is useful when it comes to service recovery, like that one with the person who stole a baby, or thought a baby was stolen, or, uh, you know, in cases where they're just complaining that our lobby smells like vomit, which was another tweet I had on day five of the last job. Yeah, I was starting to wonder where I was working, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, all of these things kind of force it, force it, you know, service recovery. We use social media to build engagement. That's a big thing that I believe in, how you build engagement with a community that doesn't have a relationship with you, that you start to build that trust and that engagement. We use it to improve the way we communicate. I talk a lot about that in my ROI conversations, but we, let's just face it, social media is more effective to reach the right people. We use social media to provide support to people, to other pe patients like us. Um, I'm a type one diabetic. I am on support groups online with other type one diabetics around the country and around the world help me and support me. This is what social media is useful for. It's also very useful to get answers to questions, to get real time answers to questions. And lastly, to build our reputation as professionals, as, as uh, individuals, as organizations. But what happens when it goes wrong? Right? Now here's another example. Just recently my hospital that I'm currently at decided that it was going to close a hospital and turn it to an ambulatory surgery center. The trouble is it was in the community for hundreds of years, not hundreds of years, a hundred years, Glen Cove community. And I made an advice to the CEO and their hired PR person that they should not just release a press release and hope that nothing goes away. They didn't follow my advice. I actually suggested create a blog, engage in a dialogue, use social media. And of course, it blows up. So there's a lot of tweets out there, and you can't read this, but a lot of tweets about how save Glen Cove Hospital. I can't believe they're doing this. How could they be doing this? Sign this petition. There's a Facebook page that goes up to save Glen Cove Hospital with 350 members of the community, one of which is running for mayor of Glen Cove, by the way, is on this Facebook. And of course, then it explodes into the traditional media as we know these things to occur, right? So things can go wrong with social media. Things can go really bad too. Now don't get me wrong, I love social media and I think we all as healthcare professionals should be on social media. And you know what? I don't think that, well, actually, I don't wanna speak for this particular doctor, but I think that doctors in general, as Dr. V says, should be on social media, yes. Uh, well, no, I wouldn't say it's his one mistake, but it certainly is, uh, he does have a lot of experience on, and he's media trained. But the, but the point of the matter is here is that, you know, even though things go really bad, I still believe that we should all be using social media much more transparently than we are. Now in this case, the transparency kind of shine light on something that wasn't too uh, comfortable, let's just say. Um, I don't necessarily have to agree with him. His main audience, he's only appealing to men anyway, so he wasn't disenfranchising himself per se. But I, you know, I would have maybe would have liked to have some conversation with him. But the point is, should we be careful when we use social media? Well, the answer is really easy. Yes, we should. But should we hide our heads in the sand when something like this goes wrong? Should we, should, and I, by the way, I didn't even know that ostriches really actually put their heads in the sand until I saw this picture. Um, I thought it was just a, a euphemism. But I mean, we shouldn't be hold, putting our heads in the sand. 
Well, I, I didn't know. <laughs> no, we shouldn't be hitting our heads in the sand. And this is really the, the, the point of con consideration that I want to talk about, is the fact that we need to be radical when we're in social media. Embracing transparency to me is being able to surface such things as this. You know, is it good that he said that? No. Do I like him? No. But does he, is it okay for him to have a voice where he could say he's the sexiest doctor in the United States? Sure, actually. Because, you know, I would love to have an opportunity to sit down with him and talk to him about how maybe that's not necessarily the right way to respond, but I love the fact that you're on social media and that you're engaging with your audience. You know, transparency is something that we all need more of. We have to also realize that anyone, anyone can and will be our fans online, or fan is the rough word. Fan is the social media term for someone that follows us, right? That doesn't mean they necessarily like us. It doesn't mean they necessarily are in our neighborhoods or in our communities. They could even be from an African country trying to sell products, like Senegal. But, you know, anyone can and will be, and we have to embrace that as part of our, our social media outreach. And we have to be able to be prepared for that. We have to prepare for the worst, because the worst will happen. And social media, and through a radical transparency model, will give us the worst. When we have doctors that say the wrong things or business decisions that impact communities in a very negative way, we have to prepare for the worst. But we also have to have faith that these tools are actually going to be the best for us. That actually, these bad things are good things. P.T. Barnum said that any publicity is good publicity. Well, I like to maybe kind of paraphrase that to say that any thing on social media, bad or good, is good. It's good for us, because that allows us to grow. And Lee always says, if you make a mistake, you can learn from it. And that's the point here. We make mistakes. I make misspellings. I quote things wrong. I tweet things wrong. I'm not Anthony Weiner and tweet things wrong, but I tweet things wrong, and I learn from them. We're not rock stars either, right? We're not the best. We're not the brightest. We're learning as everyone else because, quite frankly, our patients know more than us in this world. When I say radical transparency, I want all of these things to be out in the open. I want my CEO to tweet the wrong things so I can have a conversation with him about that. Or maybe have his followers tweet, have a conversation with him. I want our doctors to make mistakes because I want our doctors to be on social media. I want us as patients to make mistakes and make wrong diagnoses and have that corrected by the head of healthcare professionals as long as we don't hurt each other. To me, we're never in control. We have never have been of our stories, of our brands, of our messaging, of anything. We're not in control. I always say social media f shouldn't force us to be transparent. I think we should. That's all. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, next, we'd like to move into uh, Jason Pratt uh, from our Florida campus. Uh, Jason uh, has been working on a project uh, to provide uh, resources to patients um, considering orthopedic surgery, and uh, it's called a video paper uh, project. So, and then next up after that, we'll have Lisa Ramshaw with her uh, experience from down under. So uh, the word video and paper don't really usually uh, go along with each other. So I knew with this idea, um, which is definitely not an, a revolutionary idea by any means, but the concept of it is pretty unique and cool. And I think what it does is it, um, it hits the exact need that, we've been, that we all are looking for right now. And that's bringing our digital world to the analog world. Because yet, yet, yes, we are um, constantly putting lots of content on the web. We're shooting videos. We're shooting photos. 
we're tweeting them, we're putting them on Facebook, we're blogging about it, but we're hitting that world that's online, right? We're hitting that digital world. But there's a lot of our patients and a lot of people that are not always on that digital world. And perhaps those people are the ones that need to see that content the very most. So this is Mayo Clinic's YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Mayo Clinic. And um, you know, you see there, it's got a lot of views. We've got a lot of videos. Uh, we've had the, the YouTube account for quite a while. But again, we're hitting, the people watching this are people that are at, at home on the computer or people that are out away from the computer on their mobile device. Um, and then with those videos, like I said, we're putting them out to Twitter. So this, this one here, a video I shot with Dr. Mary O'Connor. She is a orthopedic surgeon at Mayo Clinic in Florida. And uh, she's got, she's uh, very forward thinking when it comes to using the web, using social media to um, get a message out to her patients and to the healthcare community that wants to see this content. So this video we did was the four fundamentals to keep your bones strong and healthy. Really simple, you understand right away with that title. Those four fundamentals, I have them completely like ingrained into my head because she preaches this all the time. But the people that are seeing this, seeing this being preached, again, are people that are on the web and they're online. So, so this tweet, perhaps, you know, Mayo Clinic and, and, everybody, and everybody else, we're creating all this content, we're putting things out on the web. But what about that patient that's in your exam room? What about, you, you know, they're asking you these exact same questions and you're telling, those, you're telling them, you know, hey, Mrs. Smith, these are the four things you need to do. You need to make sure you take your calcium, your vitamin D. You need to make sure that you're doing um, exercises every day, weight-bearing exercises every single day. So you're constantly repeating this process every day, all the time with your patients. So what if you can kind of skip those softball questions with your patients and get to the hard stuff? You're gonna speed up the process for the patient and speed it up for you. So what you do is you tell them, say, hey, Mrs. Smith, guess what? We have a video on our YouTube channel. If you go to our YouTube channel, when you get home tonight, you'll get to hear everything I just told you. You could show your husband or you can show your caretaker or your son or your daughter exactly what I just told you. And in fact, I want you to tell your son or daughter because they need to know this stuff too. As we get older, our bones get older and our bones become not as strong. So, so, um, totally lost my train of thought. That's how excited I am about this. So, um, well, I thought, forgot where I was going. Uh, so they're they're at they're at home watching this. Okay, I remember what I was now. So the doctor's telling you, hey, go go on YouTube.com, go to Mayo Clinic's YouTube channel, or search their face search search our Facebook page, search our Twitter account. We just tweeted about this. We just put this on Facebook. You're you're almost you're be, you're giving them more barriers, I think. Even though it's on the YouTube channel, they're they're gonna have a hard time finding it. What if you made it dead simple for them to get to it? So again, we're bringing this digital world to that analog world, those people that are not online all the time, they're not constantly following your Twitter feed, but they're the people that really need to see this, perhaps the most, the very most. So w of course, YouTube has playlists. I'm sure most of us in this room take advantage of that. So we have a YouTube channel for Mayo Clinic. We wanna organize, in this case, all our orthopedic surgery videos. We've got about, we've got 30 something videos, 31 to be exact. And people come here all the time to see the latest on orthopedic surgery, latest news, and, f and for example, the, the four things to keep your bones strong and healthy, right? So it's a great way when you're online, when you're on the digital world, to find this content, is to organize it with playlists. But what if I want to direct my patient to watch these videos while they're in that exam room? I want to make it, again, dead simple. We don't have time to search the web, search YouTube, and try to find it and you bring that analog world to the, to the digital world. So QR codes, not, we, we all know about QR codes and the idea, but what a lot of people don't know is the smart ways of using QR codes. 
So I'm using Iron Man because I know Lee AC loves using uh, superheroes uh, such as Spider-Man to kind of get points across. So he's got the QR code on his chest there, and this is a movie poster, and that movie poster is probably hung up in um, at movie theaters and at uh, electronic stores around back when they were promoting the movie. You scan that, and most likely you see a movie trailer, perhaps. But don't you? Th I mean, don't we think it's a little bit more important? Why, you know, if, if the movie industry is using something like that to reach their audience that perhaps is not following along on Twitter to see their latest videos, what about getting our patients to see this digital world that perhaps while they're in, in that exam room? So there's just another example with the QR code on the building. So came up with this idea talking with Dr. O'Connor. As we were actually shooting that video that you saw, she goes, Jason, I shoot these videos with you all the time. Um, I'm, we, we must have 20 of these with just me by now, and plus my entire staff, because she's very, she's very big on getting her entire staff on using, um, or on being in videos, because she sees the potential reach for how important it is to have these videos um, to educate patients and, and just the healthcare community. So most of these videos range from two minutes up to six minutes long. Uh, some of the topics are you know, hip replacement, an overview on hip replacement, the FAQs of knee, uh, knee replacement surgery, how to stay active with um, osteoarthritis. So here with the video paper, again, taking the two words that usually aren't together, we have nine videos, and when, when you flip this over, you have eight more. And each video, you're not, what, what we're doing here, we're not, the QR code is directing them to watch that specific video, but also you're getting a description underneath the video. You're seeing the physician, you're seeing what, who they look like. So if you're watching this, let's say in the um, waiting room before you see your physician, you already kind of have an idea of who they are. You're skipping, like I said, those softball questions, speeding up the process for this consultation. Um, I see all the topics here. And also there's a time code. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and pass these out because I want you guys to kind of see along as I'm talking about this. Uh, so the time code, let's say you know you only have a few minutes before you see your doctor or you have a time constraint. That lets you know how much time you have. So we launched video paper, this idea. Again, this is me working with Dr. O'Connor and also Jeff Warnock, our mark, uh, marketing guy in Florida. So it's us three coming up with this idea because how can Dr. O'Connor get her patients that she sees every single day to watch, this, to watch these videos because I almost feel like an idiot when I tell her, uh, doc, you know, she tells me, hey, we watch these videos all the time, or we shoot these all the time, how can I make it easy for my patients to see them? And, and if my response would usually be, go search Google, go search our YouTube channel, um, oh, Dr. O'Connor, I made a playlist for you, you can direct them to that. Well, I'm going to, I mean, I bet you 30% of the people are going to go home, take that information, and actually figure out how to get there. So we launched it in May 2013 version one, um, version two in August 2013. So we took from version one, took a lot of feedback from Dr. O'Connor and from her staff of physicians and from her patients that provided feedback to her, feedback to her as they would come back over the, over the period of months there. Um, and then August 2013 is when we launched the version two, so not that long ago. And this is, this is the latest version, of course, and it's uh, double-sided, and one thing we added on this is the fact that we figured a lot of people may not know what a QR code is, so we added the, um, a little br very brief description on the back of what it is. Now you're thinking, well, you gotta download an app, and yes, you do. But if, you aren't, if you're not one to wanna use that um, QR code, I, we did provide the, uh, a link underneath each video. So every video also has a hyperlink, so you could type directly in that hyperlink if that's something you're more comfortable with. But it's still a lot easier and faster to have that app on your phone, to download an app and scan this when you get home than to have to go on the web, go on our YouTube channel, go on Google and try to find it yourself. And the problem is it's like, yeah, you, may you think you found it. You think you're watching the video that Dr. O'Connor told you to watch, but in fact, you're probably watching a different one, you know? So here it's like, we're, here's the exact one that we want you to watch. So I'm usually not a numbers guy, but to prove any points or examples, but I'm going to do that in the next couple slides um, because the, this really does uh, show us 
that we, you know, we think from, the, from these numbers and from the feedback that Dr. O'Connor has given us from her patients and from her staff um, that this is working and it's, it's actually uh, increasing um, patient satisfaction and kind of putting them at ease and you're getting that message. It's like taking Dr. O'Connor home with you for her to talk to your husband or wife on, on that consultation that you guys had that day. So this is a graph from January 1st to September 30th. So it's going to include when we started, the, or just months before, a few months before we started it. And then you go to May, and you can see it's going up. Um, and then that August to September, when we launched the version 2, it goes up again. Um, they probably ran out, I'm guessing they ran out of these video papers from that June to July. So, um, uh, yes, those, and, and one thing I want to preface, these videos have been online for a while. So look at this, it's created, we uploaded this video March 12, 2012. Okay, so it's kind of sort of ran its course. Of course, it, people still get to these videos just via Google searching and just checking out our YouTube channel. But we don't typically just randomly start promoting old videos of ours on our Facebook or Twitter feeds. Now, if I shoot a video today with a physician, I'm going to put it on our YouTube channel, and we're going to tweet and Facebook about it to get to drive our uh, community there, right? Well, so this video has not had that in quite a while. So these numbers, these upticks, we're pretty certain it's because of this video paper. Everybody, um, look, I just thought we'd start off with. Um, I know all of you probably have your images of what Australia is like. Gentry, there's some slides here for you from the other night. Um, so, you know, you, I'm sure you, this is what you all think of. This is what I see every morning on my way to drive to work. Um, I'm not kidding, actually, for where I live. <laughs> not kidding. Um, Gentry, this one's for you, redback spider. It's a redback spider. Um, I have these at my house. They are related to the black widow. Every time I go and sit down on my patio furniture, I have to brush them off my patio furniture before I sit down. Okay, so now you all want to come to Australia, right? Want to see one of these too? <laughs> Some of these, I thought we needed, you know, just to remind you how great Australia is. It's one of the po most poisonous snakes in the world. Good. And then we also have great things like little wombats who are fantastic. My favorite Australian animal. Um, and this is the view from my office every day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so just to show you guys, um, I mean, this is Australia. I work for the Australian Private Hospital Association. I look after around 300 hospitals all across the country. So although I'm based in Canberra, which is the federal capital, um, I'm regularly flying to Brisbane, which is a, a two-hour flight away just for meetings for the day, Melbourne. About the only place I don't go just for the day would be to go all the way over to Perth on the other side, which would be the equivalent of flying to California, so um, from New York. So um, this is Canberra. I'm showing you a picture of it because none of you will ever come. No one ever comes to Canberra. They go to Sydney, they go to Melbourne, but no one ever goes to Canberra. Um, but it is actually the federal capital, and it was a, it's a planned city, much like Washington, D.C., so it's all laid out. Um, and it's actually really lovely. We get snow on the mountains in the winter, and it is actually really lovely. Um, so just really quickly, a little background about our health system. So we have national health in Australia, and we have a mix of public and private um, providers who provide health care. So there's a mixed funding model. The Commonwealth provides the majority of the funding. There's state governments that put in money, private health insurance, and then people can pay out of pocket as well. Um, and there's a, a com considerable amount of money that comes from the c Commonwealth, both for public and private. Um, and then the states pick up a lot of the money that um, actually pays for public hospitals, where private hospitals get a lot of their funding from um, private health insurance or people paying themselves. So just to give you an idea, I mean, Australia is the size of the U.S. Um, that's why I don't normally fly to Perth just for a day's meeting. Um, and I do cover that whole area. We don't have hospitals in, in everywhere, but we do have hospitals in all the major capital cities. Um, so the private hospital sector, there's 281 private hospitals with 331 what we call day hospitals. Um, somebody said here you would call them ambulatory or, yeah, so just um, day procedure centers. 
Um, we have a strong focus on surgical, med-surgical, but we also provide psychiatric and rehabilitation. Um, we've got around 30 A&E units. And yeah, like I said, it's, it's diverse. Um, so this is just the private hospital sector I'm talking about, not the public sector. So this is our biggest hospital in that network. Um, so it's small by your standards in the US, um, but this is our biggest hospital, Green Slopes, at 680. This is the smallest um, down in Melbourne with 18 beds. And then, of course, we've got the day procedure centers. So we treat 40% of patients in Australia, um, provide 33% of the beds, and we perform more, a, a good chunk more than half of the elective surgery. So you can see we do you know, half of the chemo and 70% of eye surgeries um, in Australia. So we're a pers uh, significant proportion of the um, surgical. So in 2009, we did some research and we saw that Australians were really concerned about the, um, the state of the health system and they didn't really understand private hospitals unless they had actually um, come to one of our hospitals and understand what we did. They didn't really understand it um, and they didn't really know what we did. They didn't understand that we do 99% of the same procedures that are done in public hospitals. Um, we also did a media audit and a social media audit, and we realized there was nobody out there talking about, so, about private hospitals and the social media, and we realized that social was a, a huge opportunity for us. So we created a campaign that's nationwide to try to raise awareness of the value of private hospitals to the whole Australian healthcare system, and we call it Australia's private hospitals. We do so much more. Not to bash public hospitals in any way, but just to try to get that point across that there is a value in having private hospitals as well. So um, I work with, I've identified a champion in each of my hospitals. We were talking about um, employee engagement earlier in a session that Lee moderated this morning. Um, so I have identi identified a champion in each one of my hospitals, and that person is my point person, that I get posters, leaflets, uh, we do. We still do bookmarks. The majority of our patients are elderly and still bring books. I mean, it's going more to tablets, but we're still getting a lot of people who bring books to our hospitals. Um, and we've got an online presence with the campaign where people can um, leave us comments and, and tell us about their experience. So, of course, social has become big for us as well. Um, we've got... 5,000 Facebook likes, which is nothing compared to what I've seen with so many here, but you've got to realize our population is incredibly small compared to your populations here. Um, so Facebook and Twitter both provide great opportunities for us to get our messages across to the public, to MPs, so members of parliament, to government, to journalists. Um, and Facebook really helps us tell our stories. So we have, um, we're different in you guys, we can't use patient testimonials at all. Um, so we can have pictures of patients up but, and kind of tell their story, but we're not able to really identify them. We can't use quotes from them. We're not able to use them as testimonials. So it's, it's a bit different than here. Can they, on your wall? Is that okay? they can comment on our wall. We can kind of say thank you or we can get back to them with the, you know, if they've asked us a question, but they have to come forward first before we can do anything. Um, so most of our Facebook posts actually show things that our doctors are doing or um, innovations at the hospitals, that kind of thing. We don't actually show that many posts about patients. So it's been interesting for me this week to hear all your stories about how you use patient stories and all of that because it's very different than what I can do. Um, recently we've been doing some targeted Facebook advertising and um, you can see just in the last month, we've had 1,500 uh, page likes, but we, and we've spent $1,137 doing that. And I just thought, so you can see where we started doing some advertising around Mental Health Week, you can see exactly where the spike goes up. Um, another thing that we run is called Private Hospitals Week. I just made it up four years ago, really. <laughs> but it's, look, it's, it's a great way to unite our industry in Australia. Um, they love it now. They have all kinds of events 
We distribute lots of collateral to patients. We can talk about what we're doing. We invite members of parliament to come and visit our facilities. We um, get media coverage and we run Facebook competitions for our staff. Again, I can't do anything patient facing. I can, but I can do competitions um, for our staff to try to get them involved in social media. So um, I'll show you some examples of that in a second. So Private Hospitals Week, they do lots of different events. One year I had a competition where they had to take a photo of what they liked at their hospital and they had to include the Facebook thumb with it. And then they had to post that on our Facebook page. We had a Facebook app where they had to post it. And then people voted and they won an iPad. Um, last year they had to do a video and because they did a video and it was a bit more hard work, they, the winning video won $5,000. We got it sponsored through a bank. So um, the staff love these competitions because it really um, pulls them all together, unites them, and different units within a hospital will even apply. Um, we've also used our social media to, with our lobbying efforts. So um, in 2011, the government wanted to means test the private hospital rebate. I'm not going to go into the whole politics of it, but basically we mobilized all of our champions in our hospitals and we created a website, but we used social media where people on a Facebook app could actually petition their MP directly through Facebook. So you just entered your postcode and it would come up with a little email that would go straight to their specific um, member of parliament. And then late in 2012, we kind of did the same thing um, around chemotherapy. Federal government wanted to change funding for, ther for chemotherapy. And so again, we mobilized our champions within hours. We had posters and flyers up in all the hospitals giving things to the patients, but we were also very strong on social media across the country. And um, it complemented our direct lobbying efforts we were doing with members of parliament. And then we got a, a temporary stay on the funding issue. Um, then the other day we were talking, um, I stood up for Ferris and, and Lee and told you about the social media book um, and how I gave this to all of my board members and one of my board members got really interested in social media. Well, this is one of his hospitals. In 2011, this hospital was caught in the Brisbane floods, which I know made the news even here in the US. Um, you can see the hospital is pretty much on three sides surrounded by water and the, on the fourth side you, that's not a thoroughfare road you can't get through you can't get in or out to the hospital they were completely cut off the only way they could get food and um, laundry in was over a railroad track for about three days all the staff stayed on site um, they closed a ward and just put the staff up in the ward they had no social media presence in 2011 um, they relied on the emergency services to get words out about the fact that they couldn't take patients, that you couldn't get through to this hospital, you couldn't do anything. Um, so this board member then got my, the book, Lee, at Christmas, and um, he decided he didn't really want to be caught like that again and he wanted to be, involved, he wanted to be much more active in social media. Um, in June this year, <laughs> luckily, they were set up on social media because this same hospital then um, there were two cases of Legionnaire's disease, that, um, which two cases in Australia, I don't know if the rule's here, but here in Australia that's considered an outbreak. Um, one patient died on the next day, and so the hospital was effectively shut down. It was, um, they were not allowed to take admissions. They started doing a vigorous water and uh, testing and cleaning. They contacted 1,400 patients overnight, basically. Um, they started holding media conferences twice a day. This was national news. In Australia, most news is real state-based. There's not a lot of national stuff that you hear. This was national news. Every TV station was carrying this. This was massive. Um, from this, they started actually testing all of the hospitals in Queensland, and they found out that quite a number of them actually had Legionella in their water. It just hadn't um, gotten to the stage where it had affected anybody yet. Um, they were doing updates constantly on Facebook and Twitter, um, three or four or five times a day. Um, anytime there was a media conference or anything like that, that was all posted on Facebook and Twitter. 
And the comments that we got from the media was that they'd really never had an experience of being of a hospital being so open and transparent. Um, they weren't trying to, the media weren't trying to actually go after this hospital in any way because they just felt like they were getting all the information they wanted. They knew exactly where to go for the information and it was, it was all right there for them, um, which was great. Um, I'm not going to go through all those, but you can see, I mean, they really, they were closed from the 6th of June until the 18th of June. Um, they had all kinds of media, both um, in Australia and overseas, um, but they just really used their Facebook page as the main point of contact, really, um, for telling everybody. And if you get onto their Facebook page, this picture where the nurses have all got their thumbs up, this is the day they got the clear to open. And if you click on that, which I can't because this isn't linked, but it's got 432 likes and there were 36 comments or 39 comments. And um, every one of those comments, it just turned into this massive fan page. People were like, we love the Wesley. The Wesley is fantastic. The Wesley rocks, you know, like you've handled this so well. We're so proud of you. I mean, it was just amazing. Like, who says that about a hospital? Like, nobody says that about a hospital, <laughs> you know. So um, it was really, it, it was just such a great experience for them after having done the floods in 2011, having no, feeling like they were powerless. All of a sudden, they had this social media power. And that's it, and that's just to entice you all to come. <laughs> Thanks. I love the before and after with the one one uh, disaster not having the social media tools and another one having it. Uh, so that's fantastic. Camila, would you uh, come up and um, share? Now we are setting you up. Cool. How great is that? Thanks to all of our for all of our technical help back here. Um, Camila Barsness is the uh, founder of uh, Dabo Health. Uh, we introduced. Uh, Dabo uh, a year ago at our Social Media Health Network member meeting and, and gave a little update um, yesterday as well. So we thought we'd want to like to have him uh, report a little bit on what they've been doing and uh, the pilot they've been conducting at uh, Mayo Clinic and what it's been all about. Thanks. You guys, I think we've had like four, I think I'm the fourth speaker in a row after lunch. If I can ask everyone a favor, if everyone can just stand up, kind of wake up your body to kind of engage that uh, present. Just take a moment for yourselves and then sit down and then we can continue to be entertained with the future of healthcare. If you guys want to sit down now, that was the point. Just to kind of wake up and be here together. Uh, thanks, Lee. Uh, first, I just want to thank Dr. Tamimi and Lee and the Center for Social Media here uh, for being leaders for the United States. Uh, in the last 10 years, social media has become, you know, it's like become so normal uh, in our regular day-to-day -day lives. But in healthcare, uh, Lee and his team have really led the charge for the whole United States. Uh, so I think that's, I, I always uh, remind myself of that, of how fortunate I am. Uh, and how fortunate we are nationally of having these leaders to help push, push us in that direction. Um, so this is my presentation. I have just a couple things, uh, which is that three years ago or so was the Egyptian Revolution. And the story of Dabo Health uh, started in this. And I was watching the Egyptian Revolution, and I thought to myself, you know, if the Egyptians were able to overthrow their government using Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, like how come we in the United States, like we really care about improving patient care. We really, nurses, doctors, if they knew a better way to take care of their patients, they would do it. Kind of like, the Egyptians care so much about their freedom that they're connecting with one another to overthrow their government. And I was like, if the Egyptians can use these tools, Egyptians of all ages and all education levels can use these tools, then why can't we in the United States, in the US healthcare system, as care providers, use these tools? Um, so it was like three years ago, I started with this idea, uh, and then two years ago, I came to this conference for the first time. I didn't know anyone here in this room, and I met Lee, and, uh, and, and we talked about what 
kind of the idea was. And he said, you know, that's interesting. And then a few months later, he introduced me to Dr. Tamimi, and we got together, and Dr. Tamimi said, you know, there's something here. This is really, this is really valuable. And they really uh, made it possible for, for Dabo to then partner with the Mayo Clinic. Um, and then last year, at this conference, we launched the site. So this here is dabohealth.com. And the idea was that anyone with a hospital email address can go to dabohealth.com. This is not optimized for mobile. Uh, so you can only do this on a desktop. Uh, and you enter your email address, and then you click here, and you say, I work at Webster County Memorial Hospital. You, say, you put your email address, I'm Camilo at WebsterCountyHospital.com, and you click sign up, and then you log in. So we launched this last year, uh, and we don't have a sales or marketing team. All of our team is focused on building this product, or this platform. Um, this is a map of our national adoption. Uh, this is just totally organic. And this is word of mouth. Like I, I've never been to Columbus, Indiana. I've never been to Lansing, Michigan. And I don't know how these folks found out about Dabo Health. Uh, but it's just been an organic thing. And so we launched last year. And then right before the launch, uh, Lee set up, he reached out to the network advisory board members and said, hey, if anyone wants to chime in or have access and, and see this tool, come and check it out. So Bob West, Chris Boyer, some folks took a look. They gave us great feedback. Uh, when I'm, that's the plug for the fact that network members get early access to stuff. Uh, so we had a call. I had some great questions, really informative. Uh, and then uh, we launched this thing. And then in about January of this year, we grabbed all that feedback from at the time, it was like 120 hospitals that had signed on. And we reached out to some of the users, and we got feedback. And then we started building a new platform from scratch, totally informed by feedback. Because we're like, you know, we're trying to, we have an idea, which is that people are going to log on, and they're going to need to see their quality metrics. Because under Obamacare, and not the part of Obamacare that may be repealed, uh, but the part of Obamacare that went live last year, which is if your hospital is doing poorly within quality metrics, you're going to be penalized. And in the last year, over a billion dollars have been withheld from hospitals uh, because of poor performance within quality metrics. So the thinking was people were going to go and log on and, and see how they're doing within these quality metrics. But maybe the healthcare industry is more reactive, right? And it's like now people are waking up to the to the relevancy of quality metrics. So we said what we need to do is get out into the field with our partner, Mayo. And Dr. Tamimi made possible uh, doing a pilot program for six months within four domitilla, which is the fourth floor. It's the heart failure part of St. Mary's Hospital. And we did this pilot within 200, and we opened up the platform to 254 people. And we said, we're going to do this for six months, and we're going to ask people what they want, what's relative. And week to week to week, we've been iterating, uh, putting in their feedback. So what I want to show you now is what we've got going on here, uh, which is, this is the production site. So Ashley is a nurse at Fort Domitilla. Uh, and this is the news feed. And these are folks having conversations uh, about metrics. And then on the top here, when you click on metrics, this is where we're grabbing these quality metrics and making them accessible to those 254 people. Because the idea is that before Obamacare and before hospitals started getting paid on quality metrics, no one other than the chief quality officer of a hospital really thought about how to improve patient satisfaction scores. This is like a sexy thing now because now hospitals are getting paid on this. Two years ago, no one cared about patient satisfaction scores. Um, so now it's relative. And so the idea with Davo is we want to simplify that information so that folks can, so that everyone can see how they're doing. Because the thinking is, we don't necessarily know how to actually improve these metrics, but there are people in the healthcare industry that do know. And so what we want to do is create that platform for care providers where they can communicate with one another. So we're looking here at St. Mary's. So this is the hospital level performance, month to month. And then we have discussion at the bottom. So we, here we have a nurse who shared an article from the Wall Street Journal People agreed with the article. Uh, 
people said, has there been any trial of white noise? That was one of the suggestions. And so this is actual front line. Here's a nurse talking with a pharmacist. Front line, organic, grassroots ideas on how to improve quality metrics. The hope is that by putting in this in the social environment, that we can learn from one another and find the best ways of improving these metrics. Um, so we have hospital level, then we have unit level data. So this is so that the nurses at their unit can see how their unit is doing. So their communication with nurses, for instance. Right, so it's like, I spent 10 years as a, as a uh, consultant traveling around the US uh, as a healthcare IT consultant. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work with a guy that built the first two paperless hospitals 10 years ago. And I've been working in all these hospitals, always putting in these systems, and I thought to myself, you know, everyone is so overwhelmed with all this new software. Um, what people need to simply understand is how they're doing as it relates to quality metrics. If you tell all the nurses that 76% of their patients, you know, that 76% that of the patients thought that they communicated well, the nurses are going to want to improve that. Like as humans, if you give us the information, if you make us aware of how we're doing, we're going to react and we're going to try to figure out. So really it was like, it, I think the, the powers of simplicity of making all this complex kind of out there data that has never been relevant before, simplifying it, and then having folks, giving them a, a, a place to have this conversation. So having a discussion or clicking on learn and learning about it. Um, because initially on the free, and here's an insight, um, on the free version that we launched, we had a best practices section. And so we came out here into the, into Fort Domitilla, bless you. And we were like, okay, nurses, what's the best practice? What's the best practice? And no one raised their hand because, you know, who really knows the best practice for doing something, right? It's like people have ideas, but they don't necessarily know the best practice. So we were like, we got to change that. So best practice, change to learn because it's like, who has an idea around changing this? And then people have ideas, so then you can learn. So learn, that was like one of the, the, the changes. And then um, if I can share with you guys also the transparency of data, because Mayo is such a leader, and Mayo does so many things that we're all unaware of, because we don't have the knowledge sets to really appreciate everything that's going on here in Rochester, Minnesota. One of the, the things that I was very moved with um, was senior leadership from the top level saying, hey, we want to grab these metrics, and we want to make them accessible across the entire enterprise. And we want to get individual physician data and make it so that other doctors can see how they're doing. So we published their individual patient satisfaction scores by doctor, uh, which is really powerful. This is the Mayo Clinic being a real leader in this because if you can see how doctors are doing uh, and if they can see how one another are doing, perhaps that sparks a, kind of a, an engage their competitive nature to a degree. Um, and then i just share with you guys this last example, uh, this Dr. Mulvey. So we met with heart failure leadership. We've been working with these folks for a number of months. And they said,